In 1872, two football teams met together at Hamilton Crescent in Partick to play a football match. In the end, neither England nor Scotland would do enough to win the game, which ended in a nil-nil draw. But international football had been born. Nearly 150 years later, international football continues to take place. But in the meantime, football has changed irrevocably. Lionel Messi says he wants to leave Barcelona. He has got a release clause in his contract of 700 million euros. So whether Messi wants to leave or not, who can afford 700 million euros? Good afternoon and welcome to Sky Sports News. The Premier League, Football League and Women's Super League is suspended until April the 3rd due to coronavirus. We'll be live to Premier League headquarters in just a moment. In that time, the domestic game has outstripped its international counterpart and many fans consider international football an annoyance to be endured rather than the pinnacle of the sport. I've even lost interest. I'm sitting here, I'm not even watching the game. I've got it on and I'll be honest with you, I hear the commentator go, we're playing Malta. He goes, this number 18, he works at the checkout counter during the week of a supermarket. And I think, what am I watching this for? I can't wait for the Premier League to start again. And I'm excited today coming here, watching a proper game. That fortnight for me is a dead fortnight. In this episode, we ask, do we still need international football in 2020? I think international football in 2020 is in quite a bit of trouble. Jonathan Liu is a sports writer at The Guardian. I think there's a general deflation amongst fans of, of most of the big five leagues when international week comes around. And that, I guess, is one of the major issues for the international game to solve. You once began a piece in The Telegraph with the question, when was the heyday of international football? And I was wondering how you would answer that question. You know, on one level, it, it depends on where you're from. If you're from Poland or from East Germany, you, you, you'd probably identify the 70s and, and the 80s as, as your heyday. I think objectively, you know, as objectively as you can be with these things, I think the last real great age of international football was probably in the, the 70s and the 80s. I think that's when you had a, a really competitive field and, and a balance, I think, between bigger countries setting the standard and smaller countries who were able to punch above their weight and make progress in international tournaments. And I think that balance, along with the fact that it was still, I think, the primary form of, of football, the, the standard bearer for the game, and, and I guess where a lot of the, the tactical innovations were kind of first pioneered in a way that isn't really the case with international football today, that's, that's probably what made it such a, a cherished era. In the piece itself, you suggested that the most recent heyday of international football was as long ago as 1984. Do you think that raises questions about the relevance of international football in the present day? I think it definitely does, because when you think about how international football has changed over those sort of 30, 35 years, the big extinction level event for, for international football is, is sort of 92 and the onrush of the club game which, as we see over the 90s and, and into the, the 2000s, begins to take primacy over the international game, not just in terms of the standard, but in terms of where eyeballs are going to as well. You know, the Champions League comes into its own as a competition in the 90s. It begins to generate overwhelmingly more revenue than the vast majority of international football. And I, I guess like international football then becomes a bit of a almost an afterthought. It becomes a place where the best players almost take a break from the club game and, and it becomes a sideshow to the main event rather than the main event itself. As is all too topical at the moment, the reason for this controversy was politics and human rights violations of the ugliest kind. A military coup brought a new administration to power in 1976 and General Jorge Rafael Videla who handed out the trophy to his country's side at the end of the tournament, had said a couple of years earlier, as many people as necessary must die in Argentina so that the country will once again be secure. Back to the Telegraph piece in question, having picked out three periods as 
international football's heyday, you then went on to say, quote, what links all three of these eras? They were eras where the very idea of the nation state was being renegotiated through fascism, decolonization, economic liberalization or Cold War. In these turbulent times, international football has often played in the anchor role in helping to define, to crystallise, to exemplify a nation's self-image. I wondered if you could expand on this idea a little bit more. This, I suppose, goes back to the idea of sport, and particularly international sport, as part of the origin story, the foundation myth, and I guess you know, the, the ongoing mythology of how a nation likes to define itself and the stories that it, that it likes to tell itself. And at times of, I suppose, geopolitical turbulence, and the post-Second World War era would certainly be, would be one of those, the dog days of the Cold War and, and kind of the 1980s would, would be another one of those, you find a, a lot of countries, you know, across a, a, a wide geographical span, grappling with this idea of who they are. And sport, and, and particularly football, as the biggest global game becomes for a, a lot of countries a way of, of defining who they are, whether it's the post-colonial nations of the, the Caribbean and Latin America or, you know, African football, I guess, which, which again comes into its own in, in the 80s and 90s. Football becomes a part of, of defining who you are as a nation. And that, I think, is, is when it, international football is, is at its, its most interesting because, you know, then, then you have undercurrents of nationalism, self-identity, which then bleed into the sport itself and I guess create stakes and create a, a backdrop that makes the overall product itself so much more appealing. So given this, the, the fact that football symbolises something larger than just a game in which 22 people kick a ball around, what do you think international football symbolises in, in 2020? Well, this is the interesting question. I mean, these days, if you look at which countries enjoy primacy in the international game, it is almost exclusively rich, developed nations who who have the means to, to create industrialised systems of youth development and coaching. So whereas, I guess, international sport used to be about national identity, I think these days it's it's more about being able to create systems. It's about being able to create industrialised systems and essentially producing talented footballers on an industrial scale. And it's, it's, I guess it's, it reflects a lot of the trends in, in global capitalism over the last few decades. Even if you look at you know, the AFC, for example, or, or, or African football, the, the nations that are doing well and dominating their regions are those with the means to do so. And it has become much more reflective of wealth and geopolitical power than it has been of, I guess, what you might want to have called purely sporting measures. You only have to look at the rise of Qatar, for example, as a sporting force to point to that. So uh, yeah, I think whereas um, a smaller country without without huge means could punch above their weight, I think it's so much harder these days because the big developed nations have managed to, to industrialise their talent networks and, and talent pathways so effectively. So this idea of football having a symbolic function also carries with it a negative connotation that you've that you've brought up there. It pushes back against some of the positive notions of progress, ideology, identity and system that you mentioned in your Telegraph piece. I just wondered whether or not you think international football in the present day symbolises these more negative aspects rather than some of the maybe purer ones that we mentioned earlier on. To take a case study from recent years as, as an example, Iceland, which... There was a huge amount of goodwill and affection towards Iceland. A fairy tale too ludicrous to write has come gloriously to life. It's one thing to qualify for the European Championships. It's another thing to take down England. But that's exactly what Iceland did this week. I was one of the many British journalists sent out there to find out, like, what, what are the Icelandics doing? You know, how are they, how are they managing to to punch above their weight? And the answer. I mean, one of, one of the major answers and, and really one of the ones that nobody really wanted to talk about was money. They invested very heavily because they had huge amounts of, of residual wealth to pour into infrastructure, training facilities, training coaches. And that was one of the major reasons why they were, they were able to become such a success. And those means are not available to a nation of similar size. You know, Cabo Verde cannot create... You know, dozens and dozens of indoor training facilities so they can play all year round. 
that's just one example of how what I guess we like to think of as, as sporting merit very often derives from, from wider geopolitical and, and economic forces. You and I are both English, which I think maybe angles the discussion in a certain way. It could be argued that the modern decline in interest in international football could be traced back to an embarrassment about being English and what that entails. Do you think there's any substance to this idea? There is definitely more ambivalence in England towards the idea of of the national team and what we used to kind of unthinkingly describe as, as, you know, patriotism has become inflected with with kind of so many other different forces and impulses that I think there's a huge number of people that, that no longer feel straightforwardly positive about the national team for, for you know whatever reason whether it's because they feel a greater affinity to their club or whether they feel I guess conflicted about their English identity which is again one of those things that, that doesn't have purely positive connotations for a lot of people and so that, that's a kind of a, a difficult balancing act. The days when the nation united around a football team in this country, that there's no guarantee that that's going to continue in the future. This is, as we know, a deeply fractured society, one composed of, of multiple identities rather than, than just a single English identity, whatever that is. So, yeah, I think, again, it's partially reflective of, of social trends. And for my part, certainly, I, I support England. I want them to do well. But it's not something that I associate with being English in a, in a weird way. It's just because I guess if I lived in Japan or Germany or South Africa for 15, 20 years, I'd, I'd feel a greater affection to, towards them eventually. But I don't know whether that's just me. Do you think the crazy amount of money, certainly to the, ever, the man on the, on the street, that football has earned, do you think that has contributed to the, the loss of soul to a certain degree? I used to go to Highbury and I remember my first season ticket in North Bank must have been about £35 or something. Has it lost its soul because of the money in the game? International football started out when the game was still in amateur pursuit. Given the fact that the domestic side of the game has become hyper-professionalised and the standard is much higher in the international game, it seems as though that's impacted the standing of the international game in world football. Would, would you agree that there is an aspect to the fact that football has now become very corporatized rather than an amateur pursuit that impacts the way that we view international football today? Yeah, it's become corporatized and, and it's become globalised, I suppose. If you're from an African nation, for example, and all of your best players not only play in Europe, but have lived in Europe ever since they were children and, and, you know, virtually never go back to their home country. It's hard to maintain a a simple affinity with those players in in the same way that you might have done if they were playing in your domestic league every week and and you were able to go and see them every weekend. That, again, is one of the things that has has complicated the affection people once had for for international football. It has become much more reflective of globalisation. And you, you see that, I guess, in the modernization of styles as well. You know, you used to watch a World Cup in the 70s and 80s and you would see genuine differences and points of difference in terms of culture, styles of football, ideologies of how the game should be played. It was a genuine kind of crucible of discovery. And, and these days when so much of the power and the best footballers are concentrated in the big European leagues, you see that a lot less. I mean, everybody presses, everybody knows how to organise a defence and, and international tournaments certainly reflects that decreasing diversity in styles and identities where everybody is, is playing a, a recognisable brand of football with players that you've probably seen already in some form. Do you think our expectations are now too high because of this globalisation of the sport and professionalisation of the sport. Have we been conditioned to only enjoy elite football? And because most international football is not quote-unquote elite in that sense, it's fallen by the wayside, right? I think it's become more about nice stories than it has about the actual sport. People watching the last World Cup and, and seeing France winning with 45% possession, I think it was, over the course of the tournament, are probably entitled to think, well, this is not how these players are playing on a a weekly basis for their elite clubs. So it's it's not necessarily accurate to think of France winning the World Cup as the pinnacle of, of anything, really. 
in terms of objective standard of football. So I think there is a sense in which, and, and this is especially true if you if you go down through the, through the smaller nations and and I guess the underdog stories that international football tends to throw up, that it's become a place where people go to not to see elite sport and not to see the game moved forward in any meaningful sense, but to to indulge in I guess quite you know interesting or intriguing or arresting narratives whether it's Gibraltar or, or whether it's Iceland or, or whether it's the rise of a, a country like, like Costa Rica or Honduras. And I, I think that's a lot of what international football is about now. You're not watching it because you're seeing the pinnacle of anything. It's because on some kind of broader human level, whether it's you know political or cultural, there is some interest there that goes beyond the pure sporting merit of it. You see it time and time again, players calling off from friend international. So... Does that really improve the, the national team if all the players are not there? I don't think so. I think one of the ramifications of the professionalisation of the sport, especially in England, has been that club coaches are very antagonistic about losing their players to international teams. How do you think this side of the game, the fact that a lot of fans, I think, will probably prioritise their domestic club over their international club, how do you think that's impacted the way that people approach international football in 2020? Well, yeah, I mean, you only have to talk to it. A supporter of a big club when international break comes up and the general sentiment will be I hope player X doesn't get injured or you know I, I hope that we just get all our players back fit and, and, and doesn't tie them out to I hope you know I hope they get left out of the squad that's the sentiment that you, that you see quite often and this is in a sense the product of the competition I guess between club football and international football not just for for airtime and for eyeballs but for time in the calendar, this this is something that that's only being brought into sharper focus this season. When when you have so much football having to be packed into a short space of time, an insane schedule, and a rise in soft tissue injuries, a rise in fatigue, a decline in standards, because so much club football is being fitted in, and and also in in the international breaks, you now have three international dates instead of two which is putting so much pressure on on players bodies players minds on calendar that it's almost inevitable that there is going to be some kind of friction some kind of conflict confrontation between international teams to which people feel are feeling a declining affinity and club teams to which they are becoming more and more attached to so what does the future of international football look like from here? I wrote a piece for Prospect before the, the Russia World Cup in 2018 that there is no guarantee that international football will survive beyond the next generation in anything more than a, a ceremonial form. Obviously, the World Cup and the European Championships are still among the biggest revenue generators in the sport. They enjoy massive audiences, but the rest of it, I think, is, is becoming increasingly marginalised the future of international football, I think, is almost inevitably swimming against the tide of club football, of the growth of and, and the power grab of the big European clubs and the big European leagues for more revenue, for more airtime. And international football is almost inevitably going to get squeezed. I think we're going to see more and more players drop out of international football even while still in their, their peak playing years because the imperatives are... The financial imperatives and the physical imperatives are going to become so heavily weighted in favour of their, their club that they are going to come under pressure to essentially drop international football. And once that happens, the product itself is in terminal decline. I don't think that's going to happen for, for a few decades, but you can already see the seeds of that process beginning. Are you a fan of football today? Why not support the show and sign up to our new Patreon page? You'll get access to bonus episodes, full and unedited interviews, and lots more extra content. To join us, just visit patreon.com and search for football today. Now back to today's episode. So far, the outlook for international football looks bleak. 
but is it fair to gesture vaguely to a declining interest in the international game? Might there even be some people out there who enjoy it? I spoke to Grant Jando, a Scotland fan, about how he was feeling ahead of their important Nations League final on Thursday. I feel like it changes every two seconds, but it's basically almost every possible emotion at the same time. Excitement is the main one, because I, I do tend to be quite positive about our potential to get results in these sorts of games. But then there's also this kind of nagging thing in the back of my head about, oh, what about somebody like Tadic? Or, you know, oh, will we be able to deal with Mitrovic and all that kind of stuff? And what if somebody gets sent off and we're waiting for these, you know, coronavirus test results and stuff because we had a few players ruled out the last time? And I, I guess there's just more uncertainty now than there ever has been. There's just so many possibilities that I'm mulling over and it's just such a big deal as well on top of all that. Looking forward to getting out of the way, but I'm also really looking forward to just the whole experience once it rolls around. So you're someone who had described themselves as a fan of an international team rather than a fan of a domestic team. Can you tell us how that came about? Has it always been that way or have you ended up there by happenstance? I guess like most people, it certainly wasn't one or the other. I grew up a Rangers fan and I was you know, quite a happy Rangers fan. I think most people tend to be quite happy just supporting their club. But I guess the more I grew up and more politically aware, I guess you could say, I became, I realised that a lot of my own personal political beliefs didn't quite square with what Rangers seemed to sort of stand for as an institution. It wasn't like a sudden change. It was over the course of a few years, probably the early 2010s. And eventually I just got to the point where I'm like, I can't do it. So there was certainly a conscious choice made on my part to stop supporting Rangers. I couldn't just switch to another club, you know. I I feel like that's quite forced. And yeah, I think you can like other clubs and stuff. But when it comes to becoming a passionate fan and all that kind of thing, it just felt quite artificial so I thought you know what let's just kind of not have a club and uh, focus solely on Scotland. What does your fandom look like in practice? Obviously now is a lot different I would go to as many home games as I could especially for the competitive fixtures it becomes like a ritual you know I think everybody's got this with their clubs that if, if they attend games or even if they don't attend games but it becomes a bit of a ritual where you know you'd maybe meet up with a few mates have a couple of pints or something and then you know we'd go to Glasgow Central train station, hop on the train for like nine minutes out to Mount Florida and you're on the train and it's absolutely rammed full of what seems to me maybe dangerous levels of people in it, you know. <laughs> um, but you, you would like get there and then there'd be like the walk to Hamden and it's just yeah, it's just a whole routine and especially if it was a kind of big game and maybe people were feeling maybe a, a little more confident about a team, which maybe up until recent months hasn't exactly been the case. But when that was, you could feel the sort of atmosphere building and then you get into the stadium and then there's a whole, you know, right, here come the anthems and stuff like that. It very much did relate to not just going and sitting and watching the game, but there's a whole before and after thing, you know. That was a big part of it. And I guess I've never really thought about it until I've been asked this question, but it is a sense of community, you know, where it feels like it's not just me and my friends, but it's like, oh, here's everybody else coming to do the same thing, and, and we're all hoping for the best here. And maybe if we do support a club and they're not doing too well, but you can forget about that just now because you're not thinking about them just now, you're thinking about Scotland. I feel like it's, it's definitely just a nice communal activity but like I said that's not really the case at the moment at least not physically. How do you feel about the coronavirus pandemic impact on international football in general then? I think the idea of club football going on at the moment all that seems to be safer and more sane than you know having let's just say club x like half the players are international players and they all play for like five six seven different countries you know like so all these people just going out and being dispersed around the world and then when they get to wherever they're going they're then going somewhere else and they're mixing with people from other clubs that on paper it does seem very unwise 
very selfishly, I guess I'm glad that it's gone on, but there is still that very niggling doubt in the back of my head of like, yeah, but is this right? You know, is is it sort of ethically correct that international football is going on? But I guess it's just the way it is. I can't see it changing because it seems like probably the main reason that these games are even going ahead in the first place is that deals have already been signed and and, and money's already changed hands when it comes to, you know, broadcast rights and stuff like that. And so once again, I guess capitalism in general is direct in football. It sounds like a bit of a cop out to say, oh, well, it is what it is and I'm going to go along with it anyway, rather than maybe not watching and protest or something. But, you know, suffice to say, I certainly will be watching on Thursday. (laughs) Obviously, being a fan of an international team raises questions about how you feel about nationality and the way that your nationality gives you identity. How much does your fandom of the Scottish national team relate to your Scottishness, do you think? As I touched on earlier on, like it was kind of the early 2010s that the doubt started creeping in about Rangers. And I guess in terms of becoming more politically aware and stuff like that, I think that happened to a lot of people in my sort of generation. I mean, I'm 31 and uh, obviously we had the, uh, the independence referendum up in Scotland in 2014. So I feel like that's maybe where I started being more than just oh, I'm proud to be Scottish, you know, it, it sort of, then there was like a definition that got added on to that, where it's like, well, what does Scottishness actually mean? Like, what does it mean? And why am I proud of it? Because, you know, I'm certainly not the type of person that thinks that there's any sort of, I mean, how would you even put it, like, sort of ethnic superiority to the fact that I happen to have been born up in Scotland as opposed to somewhere else. But it's more like, I feel proud of maybe a lot of the stuff that our government up here have done compared to like the government down in Westminster and I feel like because of that we've been more tolerant and more open to I guess outside thinking as opposed to just our own thinking. As to how that ties into the national team I think it adds in more importance to how we do because then I feel like the national team then reflects us, you know, it's almost like our ambassador and I want us to do well because then it feels like there's just an extra reason to be proud, you know, it's like, I like the idea of Scottishness and what Scottishness currently is and if we could take that to a tournament, for example, then it's like, yeah, we can feel that we've done it. As I say it, I know how kind of ridiculous it sounds that I'm sort of like putting this importance of a result of a football match coming up on Thursday could make or break whether or not we remain part of the United Kingdom. Obviously, it's not that simple, but I feel like that it, it could start a nice sort of chain reaction, you know, like ripples in the pond of just maybe changing how people look at ourselves. I hear the commentator go, we're playing Malta. He goes, this number 18, he works at the checkout counter during the week of a supermarket. And I think, what am I watching this for? I can't wait for the Premier League to start again. And I'm excited today coming here watching a proper game. That fortnight for me is a dead fortnight. One of the reasons that international football is said to be in decline is because it's been outstripped by the domestic game. I'm interested in how the fact that international football isn't as elite as the highest forms of domestic football how that impacts your enjoyment of scotland games how do you enjoy a form of the game which isn't maybe the very pinnacle of what football can offer i guess what i would say is does it always have to be elite why is that the only acceptable form of football for some people in terms of what football i watch because you know it's not like i just watch scotland games and then go into hibernation until the next international break Although now I've said that, that does actually sound quite good. But <laughs> um, but like it's, it's not like I don't watch football between it. So like the English Premier League is the league I watch the most, I think. And yeah, a lot of that does tend to be like, if not the highest, then you know, up there in terms of quality. And yeah, it's great to watch and you see all these players and stuff. And it's not just the players, like because it's not like they suddenly become bad if they go and then play for an international team. But I guess there's just not the tactical complexity when it comes to international football because there's just simply not the time to coach these players for the same amount of time that, for example, like Jurgen Klopp's coaching his Liverpool players, you know, like it it takes a long time for systems like that to come to fruition and then for the, the players themselves to learn it to the point where it becomes second nature. But I just don't think it's necessary to be 
as good as the best teams in the Premier League or teams in the latter stages of the Champions League or something. Like, I just think it's a, a different form and it's not like an unrecognisable alien form of, of football. It's maybe just something a little bit different. Competitiveness or the lack of it is said to be another key reason for why international football is in decline. The Nations League is an attempt to overcome that problem by pitching international teams against one another relative to their level. As a Scotland fan, how do you felt about the Nations League as a concept? Has it worked for you? I can say hand on heart that even if we weren't in this position because of the Nations League, even if we didn't win that group, which therefore got us this playoff route, I would still love it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a very, very snobby thing from a lot of fans of the bigger nations to say, well, what's the point of the Nations League? It's like, yeah, but it's not necessarily for you, though. Well, actually, it is for them because they also get their benefit of like playing against the big boys and stuff. And I think that's helped England in recent times where they've been able to square off against some of the bigger teams rather than doing the usual thing of just coasting through an easy qualifying group. And then as soon as they come up against a decent team, they're getting battered at a tournament, you know, like I think it's helped them. In terms of for us, it's been great. I apologise, I, I can't quite remember the two teams that were involved in this, but there was, I think it was from the last international break, there was a, a clip uh, that I've seen going about Twitter of two of the teams in the D level were, were playing against each other and one of them beat the other one with like a last minute free kick and like the guy that scored it and all the players and stuff were just going absolutely bananas and it's like, well, where else would these guys ever get that sort of experience? And not just the players, I mean, like the fans of those countries, you know, like like they, they would never have that sort of opportunity. It's not like they could replicate that by arranging a friendly because then there's nothing on the line, you know, like, you know, it's just a glorified trading exercise. So I think it's been very good for the vast majority of teams. So how would you answer the question, do we still need international football in 2020? Yes, we do still need it. I don't think it's inferior, maybe technically inferior sometimes, but that doesn't mean that you should put one form of football in terms of importance above another one. I think it's maybe up to fans individually to decide ethically, morally, whatever way they want to put it, whether they think it's appropriate to support the idea of a nation state in a football sense. I think it works for different people in different countries in different ways. Even for a, a country that could be seen as more morally dubious than another country, it's maybe up to someone to decide maybe they're supporting the idea of that country rather than what it is. Jonathan Liu is a sports writer for The Guardian. Grant Gendo is a Scotland fan and has written for World Football Index. The music for this episode is provided under the Creative Commons license by Blue Dot Sessions and the details for the individual songs can be found in the show notes. This episode was produced by myself and Josh Schneiderweiler. I'm John McKenzie. Thanks for listening to Football Today. <laughs>